Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of the Five Star Revolution Podcast. Tonight, we have our first female guest in our history of the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Here is Brittany Brown. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for so much for joining us here tonight. I really appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. And for all you listeners, don't forget to join us on Facebook, Five Star Revolution Podcast, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Five Star Revolution Podcast. So my first question for you, Mrs. Brown, is how did you get your start into the professional wrestling business? So it's kind of an interesting story. Um, a little bit childish, but um, probably understandable. I think everybody was there at one time in their life. Uh, watching wrestling as a little kid, um, the more my father and I watched it, the more it pissed my mother off. <laughs> so we did it more and more. Um, <laughs> Um, and then my sister got involved. So the three of us were always watching it. She was so upset about it. And I saw the fabulous Moolah and I said, oh my God, greatest heel I've ever seen. I want to be just like her. I'm going to find her someday. So when I turned 19, I looked for her. Now, back when I was 19, there was no internet. So it was like calling 411 and trying to find the fabulous moolah. How do you do that, right? Didn't have much luck. It took me a couple of years, but I did find her. Uh, I sent her a letter. I got her address. I sent her a letter. Uh, she wrote back to me. Um, this was in the early to mid 80s, um, actually mid 80s. And she wrote back to me and she accepted me to the school. My father and I flew to Columbia, South Carolina. And her head trainer at the time, Donna Cristinello, picked us up at the airport and uh, we met everybody and I started going to her school then. That's pretty awesome. And back then, women's wrestling wasn't a big thing. Am I right. correct? Right. So it was kind of hard to get into the business, right? It was. It was, it was very hard. Um, and it was tough because I had a full-time job. And I wasn't willing to give that up. I just I just kind of wanted to wrestle on weekends and stuff. And not many people get into the business wanting to do it that way. They want to be a star. They want to be on TV. And me, I just, I wanted to do it on the weekends. That was it. Um, so I lived by myself. I had my own apartment. And I lived by, by myself in Massachusetts. And um, once the airfares doubled, I could no longer afford to keep going to her every weekend because I used to fly myself out there every Friday night, come home Sunday night, and, and I could barely walk, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's how much work she put you through in one weekend. Um, and I would go back to work on Monday and then Friday night back out to the airport and off to Columbia, South Carolina again. So once the airfields like uh, airfares doubled, um, I didn't know what I was going to do. So I kept going until I found Kowalski school outside of Boston. And then I ended up going there and I stayed there for the rest of my career. Pretty much. Uh, I was his champion for like 13 years and I did a little training, uh, there. Um, it was a blast, an absolute blast. Let's piggyback a little bit back when you were training with fabulous Mula. How was that experience for you? You know, it was like a dream come true because she is the woman that I saw on TV as a little girl, as a teenager. And she had those dollar sign. You remember those dollar signs uh, glasses? Yep, she used yep. to get made out of diamonds, <laughs> allegedly diamonds. We thought they were diamonds, though, right, when we were little. <laughs> um, but, oh, my God, just meeting her was so cool. And Donna was like the best person I had ever met in my life and all the women out there they were all so nice. Judy Martin was there. Velvet McIntyre was there. I roomed um, with Heidi Lee Morgan and a couple of other girls. Everybody was so nice. And Black Venus, Jean Kirkland was there at the time and we became close friends. Um, unfortunately, she's passed away. Um, but, you know, it was just it was a dream come true. But the, the training was pretty brutal. So. I'm going to ask you a little controversial question about Fabulous Moolah, and you don't have to answer it. Um, God rest her soul. I don't want to talk bad about her. She's a great legend in the business. 
But I've seen some show, Dark Side of the Ring, where they say that she used to hustle the female wrestlers. Is there any truth to that? Absolutely not. I was so shocked when all that stuff came out. You know, what was it, a couple of years ago? Yep. Um, that Snickers thing with the W, they may, ended up having to make it the May Young um, Battle Royal or whatever it was. Um, I was so upset about that. And I was interviewed by a bunch of different people and places. Um, and, and I'll tell you the same thing I told all of them. I never, ever once witnessed anything like that. And I went to her for a couple of years, every single weekend. And I became very good friends with her, with Mae Young. They stayed at my house. We, we ran a show, a Ladies International Wrestling Association show in Massachusetts, which is something they usually only did in Vegas, but they wanted to do some something out here. So they had me put it together and they came down. They drove all the way from South Carolina and they stayed at my house for the whole weekend. Um, it was great. I mean, they weren't like that at all, at all. And I remember, and I've never told anyone this, but I do remember when I was brand new and I was walking from the uh, training facility past her house. It, it was in the, like the springtime, but it's hot out there. And she had all her windows open and everything. And I heard her and May talking, and I've never told anyone this story, um, including my own family. Um, and they were talking about me. And, you know, whether or not I had potential, whether or not I could, you know, make money in the business and all that. And they said nothing but nice stuff. And they said nothing like, oh, you know, we can get her to make us money or, or we can send her there to do this or that. It was nothing like that. It, it totally legitimately was a real professional wrestling business. And, and I think the people that started all these ridiculous rumors about her are people that are just mad because they signed a contract with her and they signed the contract giving her a certain percentage. And then once the money started rolling in, they were pissed because they gave up too much of a percentage. And then they were mad at Mula. Well, guess what? If you didn't sign the contract, you wouldn't have got a dime. You wouldn't have became a household name, nothing. So, you know, maybe they would have wanted to have somebody else look at the contract. I don't know. <laughs> but if it were me, I wouldn't sign a contract if, if the percentage was too big. I'd sit down with the person. I'd, you know, go back and forth and get it to either where I was happy with it or I would walk away. You know, I, I wouldn't sign a contract and this is just rumors. I've heard that it was like 30 or 40% that she got. Wow. I don't know. Is that true? I have no idea. <laughs> it was nothing like that in, in my contract. Nothing at all like that. And did I work some shows that she sent me to? Yes. Did she take a dime from me? Not a dime. Well, Not that's good dime. to hear. That's good to hear. Well, those people that did sign a contract is kind of their fault that they didn't read, they didn't read it. So... Hey, fabulous Mula, good for her. I give her props. <laughs> yeah, I mean, she deserves it. She she really was a very nice person. Um, you know, I've had a little bit of controversy um, from other girls uh, that we're no longer friends on Facebook because of this. Um, and we've been friends for like 30 years or 35 years. And we're no longer friends because there's, there's like two girls that cannot stand her that never would have been a name at all. They never would have been known if it wasn't for her. One of them was in a WrestleMania. Um, she won't speak to me anymore. She deleted me. She told everybody to, to unfriend me and all this stuff, <laughs> all because I said it didn't happen to me. That's all I said. It didn't happen to me. I never saw it. I never witnessed it. Nothing happened to me. And I know plenty of people that went there that I'm still friends with today. And they don't have any of those complaints either. So I think there's a couple of people that are just really pissed off that they weren't making as much as they thought they should be. <laughs> hey, and you were smarter than they were. So, yeah, there you go. So oh, yeah. when, you, when you left uh, Fabulous Melissa's school, how'd you find 
uh, Killer Kawashi School because back then it was only men training there. Um, yeah, well, that's what I thought too until I got there. There's a whole bunch of girls there. But I'll tell you how. And this is really talk about a weird, weird instance. So I had this really cool Mustang that was at a body shop and I was having it switched over from being blue to being black. So I was having the whole thing repainted with um, glitter and all that kind of stuff on it back, back then. That was cool. <laughs> um, but I was sitting there waiting for the shop to open and I was going to get an estimate and it was in Massachusetts and there was this big, huge guy in this little tiny Porsche that was also there waiting for the shop to open. And so when the, me the mechanic and the body men pulled in at eight o'clock in the morning, it was a Saturday morning, I'll never forget it. The two of us both got out of our cars. Now, I didn't know him, he didn't know me. We'd never seen each other before, but he looked over at me and he said, wow, what a tall girl you are. You ever think of becoming a professional wrestler? And I was like, how does this guy know me? And he didn't <laughs> know, he didn't know me because I was only going to Moolah's, right? But who, what are the chances someone's going to say that to you, right? right? So this guy was Tony Santos, who I had never heard of at the time because I didn't know anything about, you know, old promoters in Massachusetts that used to run the garden before Vince or any of that kind of stuff. I didn't know all that stuff. I was just a student at Moolah's. And he introduced himself to me, he got a business card out of his wallet. And he said he was there with Misty Blue's car getting it fixed for her, Misty Blue Sims. And I had never heard of her either. Uh, but at the time, she was training at Walters. And I didn't know that. And I, of course, knew of Walter Killer Kowalski, but didn't know him because he was a little bit before my time as a kid. He was kind of off TV while I was a little kid. Um, so maybe if I was 20 years older or even 10 years older, I may have known who he was, but I did know the name um, and I knew it was a big name. So uh, Tony asked me to give him a call. And when I got home to Situate, I, I talked to my dad about it and we called him and he took me to Killer Kowalski's. I met him and, and I met his wife and everything at his house. He lived about two towns away from me. Um, and you know, everything was legit and all that. And my father made sure of all that. Um, and we went to this horrible area of Boston. Absolutely horrible. And I'm stepping over homeless people and stuff. And back then, I had never in my life seen a homeless, homeless person. And I had never seen an area like this either. Walked up three flights of these creaky, old, smelly stairs to get up to this, half of it was a soup kitchen and the other half of it was Killa Kowalski school without <laughs> a ring in it, with no ring, just mats. And you bounced off cement walls. What? Yes. I was like, this is not what I expected at all. Sounds like a dungeon. Yeah, like a weird, smelly, creepy dungeon. <laughs> Um, and, and when I went up there, the girls that were there at, and of course me not knowing them at the time, but it was Misty Blue Sims, Linda Dallas, Kat LaRue, and I believe it was Linda Dallas's sister, Debbie Irons. Um, and there was, um, a black girl there, an African-American girl named, um, Cookie, who was there. And boy, I'll tell you, she was scary looking. She was big and she really was good. She was really good. She was working out with the guys. And I was like, oh, my God. You know, she was like giving them like 360 degree um, clotheslines. I mean, just putting them out. And they were bigger guys. And I just thought, oh, I don't think this is for me. <laughs> really. <laughs> the oh, I mean, just the I mean, the place, the girls that were there. And I was just like, I don't think I, I don't really think I fit in here. So I didn't go back. And then I kept going to Moolah's. And then about a year later, I said, you know what? I can't do this. I can't keep paying like $400 every weekend. Now, mind you, I was 19 when this was all happening. Um, so now I'm 20 by then. And I said, I can't keep paying $400 a week. 
You know, it's, it's going to cost me just gas money to go to Walters because it, it was in Massachusetts. Um, but luckily, by the time um, I'd say six months into me going to him, uh, all those girls stopped going except for Cookie. So those girls were all gone. Misty and her gang were gone. Um, and honestly, they might be really nice people. I don't know. But I was not interested in working with them, really. Um, I had heard I had heard a few stories and I was just like, mm, I don't know. You know, um, I didn't know if they were true or not, but my gut told me, nope. So as scary looking as Cookie was. I said, all right, if I die today, it was a good 20 years. <laughs> this girl's going to kill me. Even though I was taller than her, she was big and she was good. Um, and we ended up being lifelong friends, her and I. Um, this girl that scared me so much. <laughs> um, sweetest thing in the world. Uh, you know, loves her cat, loves her family, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but that's how I ended up going there. And luckily about six months into that, he started a new school that had a beautiful ring in it with locker rooms and bathrooms and everything. And I was like, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> um, because that, that was rough going there. Uh, I, I was going there Tuesdays and Thursday nights right after work. I wouldn't go on Saturdays and Sundays. Um, I ended up working for other different promoters about probably about a year in or six months in. I started working for different promoters in like New Jersey, New York, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire. So I was usually busy on the weekends all the time, whether it be working for Walter, who that was always first. His his federation came first, his booking, no matter how much anyone else was paying me, I still took his booking first out of... Um, you know, respect for him because he is my trainer. Um, and he ended up being like a second dad to me. And we were very, very close um, until the day he died. And it was it was a really good time. Good, lots of fun, but lots of hard work. Yeah, Kyle Kowalski is a legend in the business. He's a legend in New England and a, one of the best trainers, if not the best trainer of all time. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, between him and Moolah, boy... Ugh, they put you through the ringer. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any funny stories with uh, Mula or Killer Kowalski that you want to share? Well, I mean, it, it, there's nothing really. I mean, there's so many stories that Walter told, but it was his stories that he told from his time um, wrestling and stuff. You know, so they're his stories. I can tell you one of his stories that he told us that he told all of his students and always made us laugh. He always had us sit around in a circle at the end of class. And I can tell you one of his that's kind of funny, um, but it's nothing that I witnessed. He was on a plane um, coming, I believe it was back from Japan. And one of the other wrestlers that were on it was Haystack's Calhoun. Now, anybody that knows him knows how big he is, right? So you also know that he can't fit through the door of the bathroom. <laughs> and that's a really long flight. Well, apparently something didn't agree with him that he ate and he had to use the bathroom and nobody knew what to do. So Walter ended up telling him the only possible thing you can do is to use a mailbag. And they had this these giant mailbags that were, you know, probably like the size of a, um, a big hefty green trash bag but made out of canvas. And that's what they carried mail in on those planes. And that's what he had to use. <laughs> Alter said that it was the smelliest flight that he had. He goes, I don't know why I suggested that, but it was either that, or we were going to have to open the door and push him out. <laughs> so, you know, that's not an option. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that was a pretty funny story. Coming from him, it's even funnier though. Just the way he told it, and he had so many different stories like that for all of us. And and we just all sat around in awe with our mouths open, like, "Wow, really?" You know, he had so many stories, and and Mula had so many great stories too. She really, really did. And you know, she's told me some pretty um, 
interesting co uh, confidential stuff that I can't reveal. Um, <laughs> <laughs> even after she's passed, I would not do that um, because the people in the story are still with us. So I don't want to share that, but she was another one. She was funny and fun to be around. And, you know, these people that say bad things about any anybody, whether it be Walter or Mae Young or Moolah, and I know obviously most of it was Moolah that everybody talked about, um, <laughs> you know, to, to know them as a person, it was it was completely different than the character. And for anybody to think that they were like their characters, is is ridiculous. It's just ridiculous. And for any worker to say that too, it just shows you what that person is like. So did you ever get a chance to wrestle on TV? Oh yeah, many times. For WWF or? Uh, no, that's the only federation I did not work for. I got asked three times um, and Walter put the kibosh on it all three times and said, no, I was not doing it. Um, and I worked for pretty much everyone else. I worked for NWA, WCW, LPWA, um, and tons and tons and tons of different independent promotions from California to England to um, New Jersey, New York, you know, every, and ev everywhere in between, Wisconsin, Texas, um, kept myself pretty busy. Pretty who's, busy. Your, who's your favorite opponent of all time? You know, I really enjoyed um, back in the early 90s and late 80s, I really enjoyed working with Black Venus, which was Jean Kirkland from Mulu School. She was from Connecticut. We became very good friends. Um, but my two all-time favorite were definitely Shelly Francis, who was also from Walter's uh, school, originally taught by Rocky Raymond, the Boston bad boy from ICW and Bedlam from Boston. She originally started there and then went on to Walters, and that's how I met her. Um, she was on LPWA quite a bit, Shelly Francis, and she also wrestled as Rosebud in the New England territories and uh, independent federations. And the other one was uh, Brandy Alexander, who was originally trained by Tony Altamore. And uh, she was great. And and Rosebud slash Shelly Francis was really great. Um, those are the ones that I worked with the most frequently. Um, but some of the girls, I'll tell you, Judy Martin and Leilani Kai were amazing to work with. Absolutely two of the best female wrestlers I've ever worked with. So light, so, you know, so humble too. I remember working with Leilani Kai the night before she was in WrestleMania and she did a job to me. No problem. N no problem at all. And she was in WrestleMania the next day. Had no ego and boy, what she could have taught me. I'll tell you. And she did teach me. She did. She didn't know that she did, but she did. She taught me a lot. And I only wrestled her a few times. And I think I only wrestled Judy twice, but they were great. We need more of that in this in this business nowadays, for sure. Definitely. So if there's one thing that you learned in professional wrestling that you carry on into your personal life, what would that be? That would be probably how to have a lasting lifetime friendship. Because I would say at this point in my life, I have more friends from wrestling than I do from my personal life. And from whether it be my childhood or my teen years or my other career that I've had since I was also 21, um, that I still have, I have more friends and closer friends from wrestling than I do in my personal life. So I, it's more of like a brotherhood and a sisterhood than people realize it is. Um, we have a reunion every year. We, I think we're on our seventh or eighth year. We had to skip last year, unfortunately, due to COVID. But otherwise, um, we just had it last month. And it's called the International Wrestling Federation uh, Reunion, which was Walter's uh, Federation. And we all get together, everybody from referees to 
female wrestlers, male wrestlers, ring announcers. We all get together and have dinner in a, in a you know, catered room. And we try to pick it somewhere reasonable for people to come in from. We have people coming. Uh, we did it in mass and we always do it in mass. And people drove in. Somebody came in from Pittsburgh. Uh, uh, two people flew out from Florida. Uh, the one before this one, somebody flew in from California. And of course, there's plenty of drive-ins because most of us still live around here. But this was the first one, this particular one that was last month, that Tom Burke was not able to make it to. He has made it every year except for this one. And Tom that was due to his aunt. Um, there was a couple of people that couldn't come because of um, elderly relatives that they were in contact with and they still didn't quite feel comfortable, um, you know, with the COVID thing still kind of going on. So that was the story with that. Are you still part of the Cauliflower Alley Club? I used to be. I, I, I proudly am no longer. I used to. I was the only female officer that they ever had. And I was on the board for a very long time. Um, but it has become something that I am no longer proud to be affiliated with. So I have nothing to do with them. Are you involved in wrestling at all? Oh, yes. Yep. Um, so I trained girls for a while. I also ran my own independent promotion with a partner for eight years. And um, I still do the reunions. I co-run the reunion with uh, another one of Walter's guys um, that was a wrestler and a manager as well. He was my manager. And also, I'm very, very good friends with the promoter. Um, talk about lifetime friendships. Um, my best friend is actually an older man who I have known since I was about 25. And he was probably like 40 at the time. And we were nothing except for friends always, always. And to this day, we are still friends. He's back in the area He's going to be bringing back New England Wrestling Federation, NEWF. You can look that up. It was in Vermont, and they had amazing shows that I was on. I was his champion back in the 90s, and we were, we're like brother and sister. Um, he's back in Massachusetts, and he's going to stay. We, we were going to start running shows last year, um, myself and him and another partner. It's three of us who's another worker that's been around longer than me. And we got together, we decided we were gonna be partners and COVID happened, so nothing happened, but now we're, we're moving forward. Sounds good. A couple more questions for you, Ms. Brown, because I know you're, you're a busy woman and you have to get going. No so problem. my first to last question is, if you had advice for somebody looking to get into the wrestling business, what would that be? That the most important thing would be to um, have class because I see a lot that don't. But the other just as important thing is to get a legitimate trainer. That is the biggest mistake that I see. And everything that leads to injuries is if you're not trained right. If you don't know how to protect yourself and protect others, everybody's gonna get hurt. It's gonna be a bad show. You're not gonna get booked again, but most importantly, you're gonna end up in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, walking around with a limp, um, a bad back, you know, surgery's necessary. I can't tell you how many people walked in to our reunion that had injuries from, you know, a bad fall or a bad match with someone that wasn't trained properly. And there's so many schools that you can go to. You have to ask what their credentials are. You have to do your research on their background because somebody that never made it most likely is not going to be able to teach you how to wrestle. So very, that's the biggest thing. Very good advice. 
there's a lot of uh, wrestling school out there, a lot of wannabes, and a lot of ones that are really good. So that's good advice. Do your do your research, my friends. Definitely. So my last question is a two part question. What's your take on intergender wrestling, and what's your take on the current product nowadays? Um, intergender wrestling is is something that I never experienced except for at Killer Kowalski's, and he had us do mixed tags. And at first, we started doing it. It was a midget and a girl, a male midget and a girl, <laughs> and a male midget and a girl. And you know that was a lot of fun and cute and you know silly stuff. Um, but then he decided to do some mixed tags. And that's where I met some really close friends to this day. Um, but the difference was back then when the girl tagged out, the other girl tagged out. So you pretty much never fought the guy. And then, you know, every now and then we'd sneak in maybe one move on the guy, maybe a punch to the gut or a clothesline or something, and then tag out. But you didn't have a whole lot of interaction with the guys. So when that started happening and I started seeing things, you know, the past few years with girls, you know, beating the crap out of guys and vice versa. At first, I was just like, oh, I'm just not comfortable with that at all, because talk about getting hurt. Right. But if everybody's trained properly, everybody knows what they're doing and they know how to take care of each other. I think it's OK. Um and the product today, if you would ask me before AEW ever became a thing, I would have said the product today stinks. And, <laughs> and I hate it. <laughs> and I hate the girls are just TNA and they got their boobs hanging out and they're in like as much cloth to cover one of my legs. Their whole body is covered with because I'm six one, you know, and they have these little tiny 95 pound girls that are wearing like enough cloth that my underwear is made out of and that's on their whole body and it's like oh my god that's the thing that really gets me is the outfits and a lot of the girls it they really are not trained properly but once my good friend uh sarah del rey became a trainer at wwe i have to say I got to give everybody credit there. They really, really are much, much, much better. But the product, I really enjoy AEW much, much more than I ever expected I would. When I first heard about it two years ago, I said, oh, yeah, right. Somebody's going up against Vince. Good luck. And even when I heard who it was, too, I said, yeah, good luck. And now I go, wow, it's the only wrestling federation I watch. That's it. Nice, nice. I'm still. I'm glad you still watch wrestling. That's that's awesome. Yeah, I didn't for a long time until AEW. So just one last question. Sorry, I just want to know okay. if you were looking to get into wrestling right now, would you still do it? Yes, definitely. Okay, sounds good. I I was. I'm going to check out some of your matches. Oh, cool. Get... Well, enjoy. I think you'll have fun. You can watch me cheat to win. So you were a heel. Oh, yes. Awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us right here tonight. Is there anywhere where our fans, where our listeners can catch you or follow you on the social media? Oh, absolutely. They can They can check me out. Facebook is where I am mostly. Um, I, I also, I do have Twitter, but I'm not on very much. But Facebook, I definitely, you know, check in every night. Um, and Facebook, anybody can, you know, ask me any questions, contact me on Facebook there. Um, and it's, it is under Brittany Brown and I have an old email address that I won't change no matter what. And it's Brittany Brown one at AOL.com. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight on the five star revolution podcast. You're our first female. So you're making history. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. I love it. Thank you. No problem, Miss Brittany Brown. Have a great night. Thank you so much for joining us. You too. Thank you.